the guy over there next to him over there not too far was still hammering on the on the concrete still trying to drown him out the guy screaming in the middle loudly for help you know from what i could see he looked very very scared when i walked up on the scene it looked like he didn't know that this was going to happen that's the expression i saw on his face it was like a all of a sudden thing it's like they told him one thing and did another they pushed him immediately into the hole the ball on the cement truck started turning real real fast and i could see the cement gushing down that gurney directly into that hole until they filled the hole all the way up on top of this man and he had these killer eyes man he showed me his gun he said you better keep moving or you're going to be next i walked away maybe about 15 feet and i could feel somebody was following me so i looked back behind me and he was coming at me full force man July the 31st, 1975, the day after he had buried him, there was breaking news flash all over the news on Channel 2, Channel 4, and Channel 7 saying this guy was missing. Timmy Hoffa, Teamsters Union president. And I was telling my brother and sister now, I said, that, that's the man that I just saw yesterday downtown get buried. He said, Mike, you gotta leave that alone, man. It's the mob, man, he'll kill you and the whole family. On July 30th, 1975, teenage boy whose life has been defined by traumatic events witnesses the murder of a man whose death has been the subject of federal and local investigations for decades and has captured the fascination of every generation since. For 27 years, he carries this dark secret, unwilling to risk the retaliation of one of the most dangerous crime families in the nation until the burden becomes more than he can bear. This is the extraordinary story of Michael Edward Yarbrough. I met him about, um, I don't know, a couple years ago. I mean, he, this guy is an incredible story, and I'm going to get right to it. Tell you what it is. Mike believes that he witnessed the murder of Jimmy Hoffa. Now, so people are going to be like, yeah, okay, sure, bro. Well, listen to the guy's story. When you're done listening to his story, you might say, wait a minute, man, this could have validity to it. I personally have heard it a couple of times, and I believe there's validity. I mean, I'm like on the fence, like the whole thing that everybody thinks could be completely I first heard the story of Michael Yarbrough on an early morning commute to the office. He was doing an interview for the Gunner Detroit YouTube channel. The subject matter discussed was the location of the late Jimmy Hoffa. I have to confess that the subject matter generally sends my eyes rolling. Another guy who claims to know where Hoffa is. Seriously? But as I listened further, I realized that there was something about this guy's account that was distinctly different from the usual speculations. This guy claimed to have seen his murder with his own eyes. Moreover, there was an honest conviction in his voice. This guy was telling the truth, or at least the truth that he wholeheartedly believed. Not long after, I had the opportunity to hear him again on Gunner's radio show, Our Thing Detroit, a show I've been co-hosting for the last year. His account was unwavering, and I became convinced that this man was no con. He was an honest individual who believes that he witnessed the murder and disposal of Jimmy Hoffa, and I found that on a personal level, and for the first time, I believed him. I reached out and arranged an interview, and we talked about the incident and the effect that it's had on his life. A life, as it turns out, that has a lot more interesting aspects to it than just a famous mob murder. My story, three decades of trauma, 1965 all the way up to 1985. The Urban Dictionary has defined a term to describe the process of making a person extraordinary. Each 10-year period, there was trauma in my life. Traumatic trial by fire that will define not only their future, but the essence of who and what they are to become. That's what I came on the show to talk about. I'm William Crooks, and this is Extraordination. I was born in July 1957 in St. Joe, Michigan, near Benton Harbor. My first memory of being in Michigan, well, it goes back when I was a little kid and living on Apple Tree Court. I was living in a little small house, two-bedroom house with a coal box. And back then in the 50s and 60s, if it snows, you know, the snow would be so deep, we couldn't even get out of the front door. We had to climb out the window. And in the house, you know, we had to keep warm. Our furnace was like an old coal furnace. You know, you had to put coal in there to get the house warm. It was pretty old. We didn't have no TV. We had radio. We was listening to uh, Joe Lewis on the radio. I can remember that. I come from a family of uh, 18 siblings all together. 13 boys, five girls. And, you know, half the time we all lived in the same house. 
we got big families, man. It's not just my family, immediate family. It's my cousins and there's so many kids in the yard, bro. Family, man, they be sliding down the rails in the house or jumping out of windows and shit. <laughs> like the little old lady in the old shoe or something. You know, that's so many. My dad and my mom were saved and sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. My, my mother was a nurse. My dad, he worked on the railroad and he had his own garbage company business. He had 500 customers, three trucks. And he was a, a really good man. Everybody knew Mosby Yard, bro. You know, he's very popular in the city of Ben Harbor and St. Joe. You know, he had a lot of customers. And he'd get up in the morning, take us to the berry field. We'd pick berries. He'd come back and pick us up. I don't know how he did it. I really don't. He'd go to work on the railroad, get off, and go to work on his truck, haul trash. Half the time, I was right there with him. Me and my brother was helping him company business, you know. But uh, my old man and my mother used to pull us on a little red wagon to church, which was just right around the corner from our house. And that's where my trauma began, on that street. In 1965, well, they used to put the black people in projects back then, and still do, really. But they were familiar with each other. We were living in a house, so it wasn't like we was living in the projects, but we were right next to the projects. And I would go into the neighborhood over there and play with this young little girl named Diane Carter. And we played hopscotch, jump rope, went to the fish dock, they called it, but they sold candy in this fish dock and, and raw fish and stuff. So we used to walk to the fish dock and get big bags of jelly beans for a penny. You could get big bags back then, but we used to go there and get those and come back home and play again. During this time, there was this older white guy who used to come around our houses, everybody's house, selling life insurance. They called him the old LB Price Man. Well, there was this serial killing going on, and he was a part of that serial killing. We knew that it was a white man out of Chicago, a practicing surgeon. He was experimenting on black people. What they did as a team, L.B. Price man would come around and get familiar with all the neighbors and stuff, and people started disappearing. The first person he kidnapped was a young lady who was walking from the East End Bar in Ben Township, not too far from my house. She came up missing. And then secondly, my little girlfriend named Diane Carter came up missing. I used to walk her to the store and get jelly beans all the time. And her mother told her, don't go to the store by herself without me. Let Mike walk you to the store. But then my dad decided he'd move to another location, which was a new project, not too far away from the old project. So we moved into new projects and we had a nice house out there. And not two or three months later, Diane decided she would walk to the candy store or the fish dock by herself. And apparently this L.B. Price man intercepted her on the way or enticing her with some jelly beans and she got into his car. <laughs> and was never seen again until later, later. We were all sitting in the living room in the new projects where we had moved and this car came rolling through with her picture and stuff all over the car and a bullhorn on top, big, big white bullhorn on top of the car saying, if anybody's seen Diane Carter, let us know if she's missing. If anybody's seen Diane Carter, let us know. So I said, Diane is missing? You know, it scared me, you know, to death. I'm like, wow. And then, then my mother and everybody was saying, well, we got to stay in the house. Everybody got to stay close because, you know, right at this point, we don't know who's going to come up missing next. We had already heard about the uh, young lady that was walking from the bar. We really got to be careful now. During that time, while we were staying in a new project, me and two friends of mine, we was in the third grade, I believe it was. And we were walking to the elementary school that one morning in the rain. It was raining real hard. So as we were walking down Highland Avenue, down to Crystal Avenue, we had to make a left on Crystal. And we was headed toward Hull School in Ben Township. And it was me, Roger Matlock, and L.B. Fuse walking together. We were buddies. We were like young buddies. You know, get our lunch and we walk to school. But there was this cornfield that we had passed by. So LD decided he would go lollygagging through the cornfield in the rain. And lo and behold, he picks up this head, right? And he picks it up, brings it out to the street where we were at. And he said, hey, y'all, look at this pig head. I said, man, that ain't no pig head. That's a human head. It was all bloody and wet. And the eyes were closed on it. 
he had about a hair, so he dropped it immediately. So we ran to the school and told the principal about it. When we came on our way back home, it had stopped raining. All right, we noticed that the cornfield was taped off with yellow tape. Uh, state police was all around the, the cornfield. And lo and behold, the, the officer told us that they found a lot of body parts scattered through the whole field, you know, and that he had was a part of it. So we went back home. I told my mother and all of them what we had saw and everything. And I was scared. You know, I was traumatized. You know, mom would let me stay home and just stayed around the house. And we were all just trying to see what the results would be about where's Diane, you know, Diane's missing. You know, we would ride around in the car looking for her. Everybody was looking for her, but she was never found. And then one day these boys were riding their bikes, maybe about two or three miles from our house. And they discovered these trash bags under some brush. I guess they were playing in the area or whatever. And one of them went over and tugged on the bag and they saw blood leaking out of it. Called the cops. They opened the bag and human remains was in the bag. Everybody had been looking for him for weeks. You know, this happened like April of uh, 1965. Diane was in the first bag, found her cut up in 60 pieces. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. Diane was a cute little girl. I mean, she was one of the prettiest girls in Penn Harbor. Cold, black, long hair, just beautiful. I just couldn't believe that somebody would actually get a little seven-year-old girl and cut her up like that. Man, it hurts. It hurts so bad, especially when you liked her. Can you imagine that? It was your first person that your heart went out to, you know, and she came up killed, you know. In the second bag, it was my baby's mother's grandmother. And we knew her real well because we used to always go down to that laundromat and wash our clothes. It was our favorite laundromat lady. You know, she would work there. She was a coin op. She would put the money in, keep the place clean, all that. Older lady. And they found her cut up in 60 pieces next to Diane. Shortly after that, my mom was coming out of church one night and the L.B. Price man approached her. It was dark. So she felt some kind of way. So she hurried up and ran, got in the car and locked the door. He was trying to abduct her too. She knew him. He had been over our house trying to sell insurance. He would go over everybody's house. He was an older white guy, uh, friendly, scroungy looking, but friendly, wore a tie. He had to be working in cahoots with this surgeon. The word was out. It was a surgeon that was cutting these people up. It had to be because of the precision and the tool that it was used. The way he cut them, it was a surgical tool. And at the end of the story on that, they pinned the murder on a black guy that had just got out of prison for murder. They pinned it on him because it was not too far away from his house as well. You know, the cornfield was right across the street and they found the trash bags like maybe a mile and a half, two miles away from there. Everything was pointing the finger at him because he was directly in the path. But I know he didn't kill those people. You know, everybody in town knew he didn't kill them because he couldn't have possibly cut them up like that five people had came up cut up and dead so they had to just pin it on somebody then all of a sudden after they arrested him the killing stopped no more killing tried to make it look like it was him the black guy's still in prison to this day if not dead by now but i don't think he ever got out of that and the white guy that did the actual killing ended up going back to chicago that's the last word we heard you know you know how word gets out in the streets and the L.B. Price man, you know, ironically, when I moved to Detroit years later, later, I met the woman that I'm with now, which is my fiance. We've been together 18 years. She told me that same L.B. Price man was up here shortly after that, you know, selling insurance in his 70s up here in Detroit. That was scary. He might be dead now. I mean, that was about 50 years ago. Ten years later, I was graduating out of high school down there in Benton Harbor High School. I registered and everything for Fair State College in Big Rapids, me and my sister. And my other sister was already there. She was graduating that year in 75. She was up in Inkster, Michigan, 20, 15 minutes out of Detroit. Before I went to Ferris, she called me and she said, Mike, come on up to Detroit. They got a lot of jobs up here, man. Uh, they're hiring at General Motors. She got a job at General Motors in security at first. And she worked her way up in procurement, you know, office administration. She said, they got a lot of jobs up here in Detroit. They got security jobs they need down at the Renaissance Center. They're building it up and stuff. Uh, so I came up here 
And when I woke up the next morning, saw on the news that they needed to hire a bunch of people to fill the job positions at the Renaissance Center downtown in Detroit. So I got my 1975 Green Firebird Pontiac and shot down in Detroit. And I parked in the parking structure on the Atwater side, which is the hotel side of Tower 400. So I pulled in, I got out of my car, went through the door. It was so accessible at the end where you could go in, go to the movies, shop. It was amazing. They had a waterfall in there. You could throw money in there, make a wish, and all that, man. It was nice. And then they had the hotel part, one of the tallest hotels in America. So I went in there in the front entrance way, and I asked the security guard that was at the desk. I said, how do you get to Clean America? It's a temporary employment agency where they were hiring security for the building and other different jobs. So he said, you go down the escalator right there to the ground floor and make a right. So I went down the escalator, and for some odd reason, I made a left. Something just told me to turn left, and it took me to Tower 200, which was uh, already complete. You know, the building was open to the public at that time because they had two phases to the construction of the building. Phase one had been complete, and that was the part where they invited the public to come in and apply for the job positions and sightsee and see how nice the building looked. So as I went through Tower 200, which was mostly an office space building, it took me to Tower 300, which was not complete. What I saw at Tower 300 when I got there was not a tower. It was just plastic up, you know, the kind that you can't see through, but you could vaguely see anything on the other side. You could see the lights that were hanging, you know, the yellow lights and the white light. And to my right, there was this yellow or rubber floor mat where you go up a little bit, maybe about two inches. And at the back of that rubber thing, they had the yellow cones on the side of it. And at the back of it, it had a poster saying, do not enter, authorized personnel only, hard hat, steel toe shoes, and, and safety glasses. You know, so I said, I'm not authorized personnel. But at that time, when I was looking at that sign, I heard somebody screaming for help, real loud. You know, so I'm thinking, well, maybe it was a construction worker that got hurt and I can go in there and help him. So I went on down up through that yellow part, took me to my left there, and as I walked on through this little square door, it dropped 15, 20 feet down under the ground level. So as I got down to the next level, it was dust everywhere, man. It was like this eight foot wooden fence. They don't even make fences like that no more, but. It was this eight-foot wooden fence all the way around these two big, giant pillars that they were constructing. Yellow lights were hanging everywhere. There weren't too many people working there, though. That's the strange part about it. But I could hear somebody hammering into the cement up above me, you know, real hard. The guy was still yelling for help. So I looked up, maybe about 15 feet up to the ground level. There was nothing but dirt up there. You know, it was dark, not too dark, but you could see the sun shining in from the Bovian side, east of the building there on the corner of Bovian and Atwater, right at the river. Uh, that was that other parking structure that hadn't been built yet. So as I looked up about 15 feet up in the air, which was the ground level, there was three people. It was two people with black suits on, black shirt, white shirt, black tie, and these John Belushi glasses on. They were holding this man in the middle, which had a light blue shirt on and some blue jeans or some dark colored slacks on. And behind them was this burgundy Mercury Marquise with his trunk up and the lights on. And behind the stern wheel of that car was this chubby white guy sitting behind the wheel. To their right behind them was a cement truck with the gurney coming down from the front of it all the way down to this big giant hole, which was that pillar that they were building. All was turning real slow at the time. And I noticed the metal planks and the wood structure of the pillars had three levels of maybe eight to 10 feet levels already cured of cement. But on that third level, it was empty. So it was four levels of that pillar. And uh, the reason why I know because the next day when I came, there was another pillar over not too far from that pillar. It was still empty and it had the metal straps, you know, to separate the eight foot slabs. But anyway, the guy screaming in the middle, as he was screaming loudly for help, the guy over there next to him over there not too far was still hammering on the pillar on the concrete. Still trying to drown him out. He looked scared. 
you know, from what I could see, he looked very, very scared. When I walked up on the scene, it looked like he didn't know that this was gonna happen. That's the expression I saw on his face. It was like an all of a sudden thing. It was like they told him one thing and, and did another. They pushed him immediately into the hole. And after they pushed him into the hole, the ball on the cement truck started turning real, real fast. And I could see the cement pushing down that gurney directly into that hole until they filled the hole all the way up on top of this man. After that, while I was standing there trying to tippy toe to see what the heck just happened, it's this dark colored hair man with the same suit on, black tie, white shirt, black shoes, John Belushi shades on came right up to me to my right side of me and took his John Belushi looking glasses off and he had these killer eyes man he showed me his gun he said you better keep moving or you're gonna be next so I immediately threw my hands up man I said hey you gotta worry about me man I'm out of here I walked away maybe about 15 feet and I could feel somebody was following me so I looked back behind me he changed his mind and he was coming at me full force, man. Like he was trying to catch me and he wanted to abduct me too. I had just got through running track and cross country and high hurdles in high school before I graduated. So I took off running and, and I ran into Tower 400. I saw this sign saying men and women's restroom. So I ran into the men's room. There was like 12 stalls in there at the time. I ran in the first stall. I stood on top of this first toilet, shaking like dying knots, man, peeing on myself. I noticed I had peed on myself. I was scared as hell, man. And the guy that was following me, he came to the door, stood there about three seconds, turned right around and left. I could see his black shoes under the stall. You know, it's got about six inches of uh, leeway down there where you can see. All he had to do was kick the door in and kill me, man, but he didn't. You know, I guess he was in a hurry to try to catch his ride because he was riding in that burgundy car. It seemed like he was on a time schedule. That's the way he was acting, like he was on the clock and he knew what time they were going to leave after they pushed him in that hole. So after I stood there on that toilet for maybe like not even three minutes, I got off the toilet. I looked around in the hallway to see was he still around. He was nowhere around. So I went to a doorway down to my left. I went down there and that was the parking structure which they had built partially on the other side of the building on Bobian. So I turned around, I went back to Tower 400, and I went out on Atwater side over by the Canadian Tunnel. And I looked to my left, and here comes that burgundy car that was behind them, real slow around Tower 400 over by the Canadian Tunnel with his lights on. So I got scared again, ran back in the building to Tower 100, and got on the toilet in there and stayed in there for maybe about five or 10 minutes until I thought it was safe to come out of there. Because I didn't know if they were still in the building looking for me or not. So I, I came off the toilet. I went back into the Western Hotel parking lot. I got back in the car. went back to Inkster, Michigan. And I told my brother and my sister and his wife what I had just saw. They said, Mike, you gotta leave that alone, man. That's mob, man. They'll kill you and the whole family. So I was quiet. I didn't tell anybody about it. I didn't want to jeopardize that. To be basically honest with you, I kept quiet for 27 years. But 1975, of July the 31st, the day after they had buried him, there was breaking news flash all over the news on Channel 2, Channel 4, and Channel 7 saying this guy was missing. Timmy Hoffa, Teamsters Union president. And I was telling my brother and sister now, I said, that, that's the man that I just saw yesterday downtown get buried. And they said, Mike, leave that alone. Hey, <laughs> you know, it's the mob. So, you know, you don't want to get everybody killed. So I immediately went back to Ben Harbor and I ended up at Fair State for a little while, maybe about three months. I got sick, got pneumonia and dropped out. So, you know, a year went by, 1976, which was the bicentennial years of 1776, which was the year they had the grand opening down here at the Renaissance Center, uh, Coleman A. Young and Henry Ford III, the architect who designed the building, they had a grand opening for phase one. They were beginning phase two of Tower 300, 500, and 600. So they opened the building in 76. All the job positions had gotten filled. I didn't never get that security guard job because of what happened, you know, the Hoffa. I never made it to clean America to even apply. But I came back two years later, like in 1977, and I ended up staying in with my sisters up Jeffersonian Apartments on East Jefferson. 
which is on the way to Gross Point. So as I was using my binoculars and my telescope, I would look down on Jefferson. And I would see one of the suspects that I had identified that had something to do with the Hoffa murder. I had seen him several times pumping gas at the gas station. Come to find out, his name was Anthony Tony Jack Jackalone. He would be pumping gas at the gas station not too far from the Jeffersonian apartments. I seen him out there a lot of times. And come to find out, he lived in Gross Point not too far from Jeffersonian. But anyway, one day I went downtown. I was caught the bus down there, I believe. And when I got off the bus on Fort Street, I started walking toward WC3. I was going to enroll in uh, Wayne County Community College. But as I was walking past uh, Fort Street in Shelby, I would see a line of uh, black Cadillacs down there, long Cadillacs. And I said, wow, what is this? You know, as I was walking down the sidewalk, back then it was a lot of people. You know, it was like New York. A lot of people walking down the sidewalk. I've had a feeling somebody was following me again. So I looked over my shoulder and it was this guy with his white hair, bushy hair, older guy with glasses, you know. And then when I turned around and looked, he turned to the side, opened up his newspaper real fast and put his head down his newspaper like he was reading it. Come to find out that's the guy that's the chief of the mob in Detroit, Anthony Tony Jack Jackalone. Now, I don't know if he was following me or what, you know, but he didn't want me to know he was following me because of the way he turned to the side and opened up the newspaper real quick and started looking at it. But I didn't have a clue who this guy was. Come to find out he was one of the people that's some kin to this Anthony Tony Pro Provisano out of New Jersey. And now they're all connected with this mysterious crime of a Hoffa's disappearance. How did I get all mixed up in this stuff? I don't know nothing about the mob. I didn't know nothing about the Teamsters. I was a young kid, man. I didn't know nothing about Jimmy Hoffa. I didn't care. You know, I was young, didn't care about politics. I hated politics. I hated history. You know, we knew about Al Capone and stuff. You know, I frequented his houses and stuff down in Benton Harbor. He used to live in Benton Harbor. Uh, as far as uh, the mob, I read about that in my books, you know, and a little bit. But I still wasn't interested in gangsters, you know, who cares, you <laughs> know? One day I was reading Scott Bernstein's mob book in the library back in 2017. And that's when I identified who Thomas Andretta was. I didn't know him from a can of paint until I saw his picture in Scott Bernstein's mob book. I knew right then that's the guy that tried to abduct me. Jimmy Hoffa. This man just lost his life right in front of me. You know what I mean? And I'm not allowed to say anything because if I do, you know, I'm going to get killed. So... When I did say something about it, my sister, she had married a cop in Detroit. He was a Detroit police officer. I told him about it in 77. And he told me, of course, the same thing. Don't say nothing about that. That's the mob. Three years later, his father owned a trucking company. Uh, Clem was his name. He had a big white Eldorado, red seats, white outside, a nice car. Teamsters told him that they wanted his company to merge with the Teamsters. And he refused to merge, so he ended up getting killed in 1980. I don't know who killed him, but it was deep back then. I mean, they were strong arming people. I, I was working in the plant at Chevrolet Gear and Axle in Hamtramck, and you could feel the tension of the unions and stuff, you know, the power of them not wanting us to be in the union. You know, it was beating people up. It, it was anti-union. You know, they didn't want the union to be involved in the auto industry, you know, or the Teamsters. The Teamsters were strong with the union, but the auto industry didn't want us to participate in uh, union activity. I joined the union anyway. It was taking out union dues. Uh, every job I had, I was in the union. Well, the 10 years after Hoffa, in 1980, I moved back to Ben Harbor. I stayed down there until 1984, and I moved back to Detroit. And, you know, I was going to college and stuff, Wayne County Community College again. And, as I was riding the bus down to uh, Wayne County Community College, it was this advertisement of this car that they were giving away on WDRQ. Slit Small Look at the Bull Trans Am's Stroh's Beer Company was sponsoring it. So they say, put these entry forms in the box and you can win this car. So I would get off the bus, put two or three hundred entry forms in the box and get back on the bus, you know. And lo and behold, after putting 500, 600 entry forms in the box, they called the first winner over the radio. They didn't respond. And then the next winner in 1984 was me. I won a 1984 black and tan trans and They was calling me Michael Knight, Knight Rider. It looked just like Knight Rider. Five, you know? 
So I rode around that car. Well, I run into this cute girl, you know, on Eight Mile and Cherry Line. She was a prostitute. I didn't know she was, but I met her and come to meet her brother. Her brother was one of the top people with Butch Jones and the uh, Young Boys Incorporated. Call them YBI. Young Boys Incorporated was a drug organization. They was popular in selling heroin, and they would go buy the contacts, drink the powder out of the contacts, and put heroin in on the selling for a dollar. Call them penny caps. Back then, they were very popular on the streets. Matter of fact, they were selling so many contacts out of CVS and Rite Aid or whatever back then until they stopped letting people come in buying the contacts. They was running out. Shoot, not only running out, and the law enforcement knew what they were doing with them, so they stopped them from buying so many. It was flooding the streets. So, you know, back in 1978 and 79 and 80, when I was living in the Jeffersonian apartments, I could see the Young Boys Incorporated infiltrating that building, you know, come to find out. Seal Murray had moved in on the second floor. So I see my cousins and stuff coming in there. You know, they all sharp, wearing campaign hats and stuff. I'm like, wow. And I didn't know they was involved. They were. I would see a lot of the people that were in this organization moving in. And a guy named Kurt McGurk, which was in my housing unit at Ryan Road in Detroit, he ended up going to prison. He was one of Butch's main guys in 18. When they hit squad, they would ride around and beat people up if they wouldn't get off the block. They thought they was going to sell drugs on that block or they cross butch them out, you know, didn't pay them their money. They sent out the uh, A-team, you know, they had baseball bats, uh, AR-15, and AK-47. Didn't want to see them. Kirk was one of them, and he also owned a limo company. You know, Kurt's a good guy. He had his little ups and downs, but they was all about that money back then, man. You know, everybody kept like two or $3,000 in their pocket every day. They had so much money, they'd go to clubs, you know, get $300 worth of singles and just throw them up in the air and just see people fighting over it. But anyway, they was having fun. Everybody was having fun with nobody trying to hurt each other. Really wasn't no turf stuff. It was like young boys get busy at 7 in the morning. They shut down at 5 in the afternoon. You know, they didn't sell all night. It was just that type of thing over there on Monterey and Linwood and Dexter and Dwayne. You know, we used to go over there all the time because my relatives stay over there. Uh, Vinewood and all over in that area. The West Grand Boulevard and down the street from Motown Records. Around the corner was Butch. That's where the young boys originated from, right there on Monterey. It spread it all down Linwood and all down Dexter and Dwayne. Then it ended up spreading all over Detroit. It ended up on Nationwide. They was everywhere. During that time, after I had won that 1984 Trans Am, me and Larry Poindexter, which is Uncle Bo, they called him. He was one of the top leaders of Young Boys Incorporated. We was riding one day over on the east side. We went to go see the Curry Boys, you know, big man, little man, you know, good friends of mine. So we rolled over there and we kicking with the big man, little man. All of a sudden, this young boy come walking up to the car, a white boy. He was like 14 years old. One of the Curry boys, a uh, little man, told us, he said, oh, that's my man, he cool. He asked uh, Bo, could he join Young Boys Incorporated? And Larry immediately told him, no, nah, man, you can't join this. No, nah, go ahead on. So, you know, I tried telling uh, Bo, I said, man, he looked like the police, man, you know. And come to find out he was working for the police, you know. And, but little man took him under his wing, gave him that nickname, White Boy Rick. That's how he got his nickname. But Curry Boys gave it to him, little man. As the time went on, you know, everything just started crashing in, man. Everything. Young boys, it just started crashing down, man. Like around 1986, 87, somewhere around there. Which had already got caught and they put him in prison for a minute. Portion was running the organization over on the west side, over there by Mark Twain, Seven Mile, over that way, Wyoming. With the Moscone dogs and the best friends and all them was over there. They didn't quite get along too well, best friends and sconies, you know, but they, they did their thing, you know, but they stayed away from Young Boys Incorporated because Young Boys wasn't into that gangbang stuff. So they kept their distance from them, but Porsche was running the organization back then, and this was back in 84, 85. And then Scooter Bob was riding up and down the street over there on his moped. He had sounds on him. Somebody shot him in the and killed him over there. But next thing I know, Frank Newton was over there cutting people's head off, sending their head to their mama's house on a silver platter. Frank's a good friend of my cousin over here on the east side. You see Frank a lot before he died, right down the street from me. You know, very proper, still crazy as ever, but you'd never think he was a stone cold killer like he was.
you know, when I was coming up, our mother and father instilled in our minds that, you know, get your education, man, you know, get your good job you know, and retire, you know, which I did. And I stayed focused on my education all throughout that Young Boys Incorporated experience. But like I said, you know, when you're around a lot of friends and family that's involved in that, you tend to see a lot, you know, even though you're not participating, you see a lot going on. And a lot of that stuff that was going on, I disagreed with. I was staying focused on doing the right thing. And I didn't want to see my people going out like suckers, man. And they were all going out like suckers. You know, you can't base your life on selling drugs. I mean, come on. Not only are you doing something illegal, but you're hurting your own people with that stuff. You know, I've seen a lot of people die from overdoses of heroin. A lot of people. Almost everybody I know that was doing it is dead. This go all the way back to the 60s. And they tried to get me to join the organization. Bo, you know, they did everything he could. Stole my Trans Am from me. Even though I was still going with his sister, he tried to kill me, man. He uh, put some heroin in my drink. You know, I was drinking some Cavassier. I didn't know they had slipped it in my drink. And I was feeling funny. So I got out the car. And that's when he stole my car. As I was laying on the side of his mother's house, Lord sent the rain and the rain is the only reason that I'm still living today because that rain got on my face the cold rain and it brought me back but I would have died that day I had to get my brother-in-law he was a Wayne County Sheriff I had to get him to get my car back from Bo they wanted to use that car to chop it up and get the money off the insurance and let them young boys roll that was their main words let them young boys roll you know $15,000 would have helped them for that car. That, that would have helped out a lot. Yeah, I got it back and I refused to join. And uh, yeah, he couldn't get me that way. So next thing I know, two or three weeks later, he sicked his boys on me. Back then they had beepers and payphones. He would beat one person. It looked like 50 people would be on the block in one corner. That fast, in less than 10 minutes, they started chasing me, man. I was on my brother-in-law's bike. I tore it up trying to get over a fence, bent the wheel. I ran all the way from Cherry Line to Wyoming and there was this bus sitting there. The bus driver had the door open. I ran on the bus. He shut the door right quick. They were beating all on the bus trying to get to me, man. Uh, they was trying to kill me because I didn't want to join Young Boys Incorporated. And I was 27 years old. So we were all young, you know, and bouncing in the car, you know, the music. We was having fun, you know, but I was having my kind of fun, just enjoying my young life, trying to get my education. And they was having their kind of fun. That was criminal activity to me. All the stuff they were doing was mayhem and murder, you know? You know, I didn't want to be a criminal. I wasn't nowhere near like them. You know, I was just into pretty girls, and, you know, just had a few drinks here and there, you know, but I wasn't into all that selling drugs and all that, man. Just wasn't into it. And I couldn't see our young youth going out like that. Another 10 or 15 years later, I was trying to be a state trooper. You know, you got to score 98. I scored an 89, so that's how I ended up in the Department of Corrections and working in the prison. When I was working at Ryan Prison here in Detroit, they rolled White Boy Ricky in there. He was there about two weeks. He was in my housing unit, and they was bringing garbage bags full of letters and stuff, cards, saying, let White Boy Rick go, let White Boy Rick go. During those two weeks while he was there, them young boys was in there, right? Young Boys Incorporated, and half of them was locked up. They knew him. You know, they knew he had, uh, he went to the feds and stuff. And that's the reason why young boys crashed because of him. He had to get out of there because he was in general population and I could see the tension growing in there and I had to get him out of there. I knew firsthand what it was all about because I remember him on the streets when he wanted to join young boys, you know. Even though little man Curry said it, you got yeah, man, squash that, that's a pass, man, you know. Yeah, ain't nothing you can do about it now, but... Uh, a lot of those guys still got animosity toward Rick in the prison. So I had to get him on the first bus smoking two weeks later. I had, you know, rolled him out because I didn't want him to get hurt. You know, I was responsible for him getting out of the Ryan Road. <laughs> I don't know where they rode him to, but the feds screwed him over, man. I never seen anything like it. You know, he did them a favor to clear the streets of the drugs, but feds sent him on a mission. You know, I think where he made his mistake is he started selling drugs himself. That wasn't a part of the program, you know? Yeah, I was there at Ryan Road in 96 when these guys contemplated on escaping. And they did. One guy, Mark McLeod, you know, he was with the Young Boys Incorporated. He had plenty of money. 
he said, I'll give you $15,000 to just turn your head the other way. I was a perimeter officer at the time, you know, riding around in the truck with the shotgun and the handgun and the AR-15, you know. And uh, I said, no, nah, man, I ain't finna get involved in no stuff like that, man. What's wrong with you? You know, he in there, you know, triple life bit and killed 72 people. He's a hit man, you know. And you know I don't want you out on the street if anybody you know, I don't care what kind of money it is you're the last person to come to me with something like that you know, I don't care if you're in there still in license place don't even come to me with that yeah he offered me $30,000 he said I'll get the other fifteen dollars after we get out so I immediately went up to the warden's office and told Warden Burke I said Warden Burke they talking about escaping yeah, he offered me $30,000 to McLeod and she said yeah bro this is a prison. Don't you know that's all they think about is escaping? So I immediately left out of her office. I went off on stress leave. I think I was off like two and a half months. I went back to Ben Harbor and stayed in my house in Ben Harbor. I had a house here and a house there. Took my wife and kids and everybody out of here, man. Next thing I know, the phone's ringing. And, yeah, bro, get back up here. Get dressed out. Just had an escape. The way they escaped. Between Mound and Ryan, somebody had threw some wire cutters over a fence and a shotgun. And uh, the girl that had took my place in the perimeter vehicle, she fell for the ride. So she's all on the news. They had her house all on TV, the cameras, the house was all junky. It was a shame. <laughs> that would have been me, you know. I'm like, oh, man. She lost her job. I think she probably got locked up for conspiring to the crime. You know, she was a nice young lady, nice looking. I'm surprised she fell for that, man. I'm surprised, but they fall for everything, man. They be bringing drugs in the prison, all kind of stuff, man. You'd be surprised how many officers would want that supplemental income. You know, they offer them four or five hundred dollars. Yeah, jump for it. I came back to Detroit. I'm walking around in the neighborhood, AR-15, bulletproof vest, helicopters, dogs. We had the state police over here, correction squad. Everybody was out on the street looking for these guys. One of the guys told me, he said, yeah, bro, you get out of here, I ain't coming back. He didn't. We found him in the driveway over on Six Mile, right around the corner from the prison. He was laying there slumped over with needle marks on his arms and OD'd. So I told the other officers, I said, he told me he wasn't coming back, and he didn't. There he is. He was tired of being there and there. He was in there for murder as well. So most of them that escaped, they had murder bits. All of them was in there with life sentences. They got away. But we got them all back. One was in Southfield in a motel. The ring leader, the one that was trying to pay me to not shoot him. Anyway, we got all eight of the other guys. Didn't nobody resist. They all came back peacefully and they were all detained. And we had to ride them out to another prison the next day. You know, we can't stay at the same facility. And the whole prison was on lockdown after that for several days. Everything was back to normal after that. But all that could have been avoided if somebody had to just listen to me. That's my job. We're right there, first responders on the job. We see everything, hear everything. You know, when you're in administration, you don't really know what's going on unless we pass on that information. You know, I don't care how many cameras you got, you can be looking at the cameras, but people who are actually out there mingling with the inmates are the ones who really get firsthand information and knowledge about what's going on in that place. Carl Hudson. He had met me in the bathroom at Smokey's Lounge in Ben Harbor. He said, what's up, Mike, man? Today my birthday, man. But you know what? It don't seem like I'm going to live to see my next birthday. And I'll be like, damn, man, don't say that, man. You'll be around here till the chickens grow. And so we went skating like a week later. He had stole his dad's car. And his dad was a preacher. He owned his own church and everything. He stole his dad's Nova. Everybody was drunk. We got up there. We were skating and stuff. And on the way back... Everybody wanted to stop at the gas station to get some more liquor. I said, man, I'm high enough. I'm driving. I ain't got no business driving drunk. So we kept on going. Next thing we know, Carl's passed us up real fast in his dad's car. He flew past us, man. I said, oh, man, ain't that's how I drink it again. Next thing we know, police down the street. Then I ran into a tree. Four of my friends was in the car. Three of them died. Arms wrapped around their heads. Eyes popped out of the heads. It was terrible. It was horrible. They tried to pass another car, and another car was coming over the hill. 
So they had to swerve to the left and ran into this big tree. And I had to go to all of them's funeral. I think I might have been like 25, 24 years old at the time. Well, the part where I wanted to come forward to talk about Hoffa, 27 years after being quiet about it, not hiding, but not saying nothing about it, felt kind of bad because I'm in law enforcement. And all the law enforcement officers are state police and sheriff and city police, and everybody's telling me to be quiet about it. I finally came forth November 2002. I went downtown to the McNamara building on the 27th floor, I believe it was. I just came in cold, man. I just got tired of thinking about it. And I just said, I'm going to go down here and tell these people what I saw. I sat down and talked to a few of the federal agents and told them everything about what I saw, just like I told you. I drew a map of the area. I couldn't really remember exactly which tower it was because the building is built in a circular motion. When you get inside, you can get confused. You don't know if the tower is on the river or on the Bovian side or what. The first entrance they had, it wasn't like it is now. You entered from the Atwater side. And that's what confused a lot of people was to which tower was which. But you come through Tower 100 into the uh, main lobby area. What happened in November of 2002, I was up there talking to the agents. I drew a map to where, you know, I thought this happened at. And it was the wrong tower. It was Tower 400. But it, actually, it was Tower 300. So as I revamped the situation, as far as the date and time and everything, it finally dawned on me it was Tower 300. I said it was 1020 at first in Tower 400. I was thinking it happened in the morning time. And at one time, I thought it happened in 1977, you know. And it had been 27 years ago. I just couldn't really remember until it dawned on me that he came up missing on July the 30th, 1975. <laughs> and it had to be on that day that he came up missing, of course. So I put that together. Well, they was looking at me like I didn't know what I was talking about. I mean, this guy serious. They didn't believe me at all. They was looking at me like I was some type of quack. But I, I went on and on and on and told them, and they said, okay, Mr. Yarbrough, thanks for coming by. And then it got to the point where I kept coming and kept coming and kept calling and kept writing them letters and stuff till they told me to cease and desist or they was gonna lock me up. So I looked at them, I said, lock me up for what? You know, for reporting a murder? State police, they believed me. As a matter of fact, state police went in the building, me and homicide detective went in the building December the 4th of 2018. And we did a walkthrough with GPS and camera and stuff. I took the sergeant through every step that happened and everything that happened. And we stood right on top of Hoffa's grave, man. It was an eerie feeling, but, you know, six months later, the feds came back, told him that he had to cease and desist because that's their jurisdiction. The feds been blowing dust off my file for 21 years now. And why are they holding my file? Why don't they give my file to the state police and so they can go ahead and go in the building and do a ground penetration search and get the man out of there? They just started listening to what Stephen Andretta told them in August of 1975, a big lie saying that Hoffa was taken from the Raleigh house in a gateway transportation truck and they was putting a 55 gallon drum and taking it to Moscato's dump. Now they're still listening to Stephen Andretta and getting ready to dig in New Jersey based upon that same lie that he put out in 46 years ago. I mean, come on. And Dan Modia, this journalist out of Washington, D.C. that's working with Eric Shine on Fox News, the riddle, the uh, search for Jimmy Hoffa. I'm talking to Eric Shine. He's supposed to be coming down here and talk to me and Gunner and Scott about this, but they're not going to do it until they do the dig in New Jersey. And I keep telling them they're just wasting their time, energy, and resources again doing a stupid dig that Stephen Andretta is trying to divert them from the actual location. There's a lot of people that go down if things are brought out to the light, you know, and I understand that, you know, and somebody's blocking them from going in there. And, uh, you know, there's a million reasons why, I guess. And it goes all the way to Richard Nixon's administration. And then, too, it might be more people buried under that building than just Hoffa. You know, it could be a mob cemetery. We don't know. I don't know who all got buried in there before they started Tower 300. Yeah, they tried to give me a polygraph. Actually, they did. 
uh, Steve Gargiola, Channel 4 News, actually invited me down to the station. I was trying to get on that Riddle podcast down there because they invited Marvin Elkin down there, Hoffa's limo driver, who said that he heard my boss, Chief Anthony Tony Jack Jackalone, say, say good morning to Hoffa, boys, when they was walking across the catwalk from the Omni Hotel back in uh, 84, I think it was. He was lighting Anthony's cigar, and he looked over to the building structure in the Renaissance Center and said, say good morning to Hoffa, boys. Marvin was there the day that it, it was a mad rush to pour the cement because I was there that day and I saw the mad rush. It was calling all the carpenters from everywhere to pour the cement, build the planks and pillar structures and different stuff to build the foundation of the building. The Renaissance Center at one point that had the most cement poured in America. Well, come to find out, Turner Construction out of Chicago owned the contract, so it was 100% controlled by the mob. That's fact-checked by the Michigan State Police in 1984. Getting back to the polygraph exam, First, I went down an interview with Steve Garagiola, retired now from WDIV Channel 4. Went downtown and he set me down and we went through the whole scenario about what I just told you about what I saw happen to Hoffa. Uh, I don't know if he found my interview believable or not, but him and another guy took me up to Pontiac, Michigan, and I took a polygraph examination with a Michigan State Police officer. It was not a pass or a fail. It was like non-conclusive. They couldn't really come to a conclusion whether or not I was telling the truth or not. But I guess non-conclusive means that you are allowed to take it over again at some later date or something. But if I'm lying, then the polygraph test is not accurate. Here in Detroit, the media don't even want to hear what I got to say, man, unless law enforcement is backing me. That's why they keep blotting me out, man. Law enforcement don't want to even acknowledge what I saw. I never seen so much corruption in my life until I moved to Detroit. It's insane. And I don't think it'll ever change. It's that money, and the money is the root of all evil. And as long as money is involved, that black market money, you know, that underworld money, it's going to always be this way, man. It, it never changes. Yeah, people say, well, you stupid, man. How you coming forth with something like that? <laughs> People are saying, man, you jeopardizing my family. You know, even my fiance, her kids are saying, hey, man, you jeopardizing my mom, man. For saying this stuff on Facebook, man. they don't know. You know, everybody's dead or either everybody's too old to go to prison. So what the heck, you know? When I first started acting, I got my experience in high school in performing arts. And then I went on to Lake Michigan College in Benton Harbor and got into intro to theater. And that carried me on up here to Detroit, where when I was singing in the choir, we all got in the church van and we were on our way to Flint, Michigan to sing in the choir. And one of the members of the choir asked me, hey, Mike, what do you want to do in your retirement? So I said, well, I, I got experience in acting. Uh, I'd like to get into the movie industry. So she said, well, my husband got a cousin that's producer, director, and film, and they're getting ready to shoot this movie here in Detroit called 5K1, which the stars of that particular film was the actor Clifton Powell and Melvin Jackson Jr. in The Wire. So we met up at the Ramada Inn in Southfield, Michigan. And I did a, a acting interview and I passed that. They, they like to put people in a position where their career coincides with the part. Since I was in law enforcement, they put me in as a FBI detective, taking down this drug gang called SMB out of Southwest Detroit. And it was interesting. You know, I, I did the part. I had three or four parts in the film. Back in 2010, it was released. We had a red carpet review on 12 Mile and Telegraph at the theater out there. And Clifton Powell, everybody showed up. And we talked and he said, man, I sure like to have you as one of my security guards in some more movies or something. You know, you're pretty good. And we went on to talk. He knows a lot of the actors that I know that I went to school with and was raised with, like Sinbad and, and Ernie Hudson and, and Vivica A. Fox and Cedric the Entertainer. I said, well, wow, man, I'll be getting with you in the near future. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, check it out, man. Check it out. Well, thank you, man, and thank you for taking your time up with me, man, because a lot of people don't want to hear about trauma and murder and mayhem. When I took an oath to be a corrections officer, I took an oath to be an honest person, you know, a law-abiding person. You got to try to do the right thing, man. 
Spike Lee said that in the movie, do the right thing. You know, he's trying to address that that message to our people that that's what you're supposed to do. You know, you can't just keep going around trying to be drug king fans and big time hitmen and murderers. That ain't the lifestyle you should live. You know, get your education. You know, raise your kids. Be a family man. You know, you get right with God. You know, sick of all these single household parent things. Man. Just get your woman to stay with her. Bump divorce, you know. Stay with that woman. Make it work. Yeah, that changed Detroit. That changed a whole lot of suburbs too, you know. But it was nice talking to you, man. Let me go see what my my old lady wants. I think she wanted to make a run out for it. But well, thanks, man. Get in touch with me. Okay, tell Gunner I said what's up, man. And Scott too. Tell Scott I said what's up, man. Okay, bye bye.